I've been moving the mic up and down and been a little hard to hear, so I'm going to try and do better this time. If you can't hear me, wave your hand and I, I'll get the message, okay? <laughs> so we certainly want everyone to be able to hear. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. This is uh, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Mountain View and Los Altos and Palo Alto, along with the American um, Association of University Women, the Los Altos Library, KMTV, and on the Media Center. Now we're going to go into the second portion of our program, which is about the sheriff's candidates. There are three people running for sheriff this time, um, and we have two of them here with us tonight. The incumbent, uh, Laurie Smith, was unable to attend. Apparently she has a business meeting that she has to be at. But we are um, lucky to have Richard Calderon and Martin um, Monica. Monica here. And uh, so they will be answering lots and lots of questions for us. Um, I'm going to go over the ground rules real quickly. Um, please don't interrupt each other. And um, also, there's not supposed to be any clapping. Everybody's been doing very well with that. And um, watch the timers. These two women in the front row are going to be holding up little cards that say when 30 seconds are remaining and when you need to stop. And um, so just keep your eye on them. Uh, the, the way we run this is that you have two minute opening statements and then um, we all will alternate who gets the, uh, the questions first. You'll both answer the same questions. And um, so uh, Mr. Calderon won the toss, so he gets to have the first opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and will they throw something at me to tell me when to start? Whatever you start. Yeah, start. All right. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Voters League of Women. I'm Richard Calderon, and I'm retired San Jose Police Captain. 32 years ago, my brother was killed in the San Jose, in a senseless, senseless act of violence by gang members. No, he was not a gang member. But his death inspired me to work with youth and also to work with the community to prevent similar types of incidents, yet still we hear about them all the time. I am proud of my 30-year career with the San Jose Police Department, where I retired as a police captain. With this, I participated and engaged myself in various activities and received many awards for this. As the sheriff, I will participate in the countywide Police Chief and Sheriff's Association as the Chief of Gustine, I was the Chair of the Merced County Police Chief and Sheriff's Association. As a police captain, I helped develop the Mayor, Mayor Reed's five-year plan for the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. I also have a bachelor's degree in science from San Jose State University, and I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in leadership. In 1976, I was an alternate for the Olympics in wrestling, in 77, I was a Pan American silver medalist representing the United States, and in 1983, I was a silver medalist in boxing in the Asian Games. I am bilingual Spanish, I speak some Vietnamese, and with your help, I will restore the Sheriff's Department to the respect level it once had. You, the taxpayers, have paid $8 million in the past five years in lawsuits. $990,000 of that was paid to the Hells Angels. I will hold public meetings to receive input from you and to help work public safety. I am endorsed by Mayor Chuck Reed. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to try to use without the microphone right now because I have um, No, oh, please, no. please. Okay, I'm going to work with my cards then. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Monica. I'm a retired chief of police. I was born and raised in Palo Alto, so I grew up in the area. But what I wanted to do is try to bring some points to to you in regards to the current sheriff, which nobody knows about. Um, it's factual information, and I think it's pertinent to the election process. Um, the last forum, uh, Lori was talking about developing revenue by investigating county employees on fraud, uh, sick leave, and so forth. That's already being done throughout the county. She states in the Gilroy paper, the budget is boring, so she's bored with the budget, which runs the department. 
She's lost about $3.5 million a year, and she gives a quarter of a million dollars in overtime to her 12 member staff. If you look at 3.5 of the time that it's been in existence, the academy, it's $30 million of waste. Um, Lori was elected in 1998. She was never a, a police chief or a sheriff like Rich or I, yet she, she said in the paper that only the most qualified should run. So in that case, Lori shouldn't have run and she shouldn't be sheriff now using her um, idea. Endorsements. Lori talks about all these endorsements that we get out there. Um, she talks about endorsements, but she doesn't talk about what she's done in the department. Uh, any person in that position, I would assume, had those type of endorsements. You are what you do, not what you say. Lori's greatest accomplishment is the police academy, which is losing $30 million currently. Um, she talks about the supervisors giving her money. All the sheriffs got the money as well, and they'll, the future ones will as well. Lori is against Obama Health Care and the Santa Clara Children's Initiative to help the children with no health care. That creates problems for the children, can't go on to school, and then they become um, out there uh, at a high risk. In different cases, she didn't, she botched the DeAnza rape case, DeAnza racial profiling case, the pink poodle murder. Thank you. Well, apparently we need some questions. Um, so has every, the, does anybody need a, um, a card? We do, we have a question. Okay, so, um, yeah, Mr. Monica, could you go first? So we'll, we'll alternate with the questions, who goes first? Okay. Um, what inspired you in your youth to pursue a career in law enforcement? Um, well, my dad um, was a parole officer and a probation officer um, during the time that I was growing up. So I saw a lot of those activities and I, I felt that would be um, a good way to get into police work is, is maybe through parole or probation. But what I found was I wanted to get into police work to go out and help the community. I have a social work background, a bachelor's in social work, and I did take care of um, individuals that had mental health and alcohol problems. So that gave me the inspiration to go on. Well, at school, I met a lot, at a college, I met a lot of people in different organizations, and we talked about what would be one way to impact the community right away as, and maybe make a change. And so with that, I felt, you know, I want to get into police work because I'm out with the community. I can prevent things from happening. My whole goal is prevention, not reaction. Uh, I'd rather prevent you from being hurt compared to reacting quickly after it's happened. So that's what really generated my ideas to get into law enforcement, my parents, mom and dad, especially dad in probation and parole because he did bring home a lot of information in those areas. So I became interested in it over time. That's also why I went into social work. I believe that helps the officers do well when you work with people because it is a people job. Thank you. Same question? Same question. I have to be honest with you, for me, it was Zorro, the Lone Ranger, and Batman. I do have pictures of myself when I was four years old and five years old holding a gun and a badge and telling people I was going to be a detective. I'll have to say as well that I must add something that's very different. That when I was in high school, in my community, there were many people who talked horribly about law enforcement and the government. I was told by my family not to join the police department and that many times they were pigs. I joined the police department because of the incident that happened with my brother. And with this, I had the full intent to go in the community and prevent youth from getting killed, getting hurt. We have a serious problem at this time still. The FBI in January 2009 said that gangs are responsible for 80% of all crime. Last year we spent $8 billion in incarceration and they're estimated it's gonna cost $10 billion. We have to do something very different to stop the number of youth who are involved in gangs and drugs. I'm gonna do that for you by starting a countywide gang task force and stop the amount of loss of life and money. 
Um, and you'll be answering this next question first. Well, I saw you about to put your hand up, so I'll stop. Alternate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your qualifications for the position of sheriff besides being a, having been a police officer? Thank you for asking that question. I was a police officer for 10 years and received awards from the Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, the City of San Jose, and others, the Hispanic Foundation, for being the Officer of the Year. I did extensive work in investigative <coughs> investigations as an officer. As a sergeant, I worked in several investigative units and also received awards from the community because I helped put together then it was Susan Hammer's first curriculum to prevent youth from joining gangs and drugs. I did the research, put the package together, and was part of the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. I received some awards for also being involved in investigation work in grand theft and also with the gang unit. I was the chair of the countywide senior abuse program. I, I worked, I loved working as a lieutenant. I also received multiple awards and also worked investigative units. As a captain, I was the chair for the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force and put together a strategic action plan. I have continuously worked in the community in a community policing mindset and worked with the county to receive input. The incumbent has not. She never worked in investigative unit, never worked in patrol investigations, nor as, whenever was a lieutenant. So that's what has made me and makes me the more qualified candidate. Thank you. I, I think my background as well, just like Rich was in San Jose PD and, and we did a lot of good police work. Um, but the main thing is my community background and being out with the community. Uh, I, I just helped the community in San Jose stop the sale of alcohol. I was the only law enforcement officer involved in that. We went to the, the uh, planning commission to stop that. So it's a matter of getting out and working with people to prevent. Um, we can do all these task force, which I agree on, but on the other hand, if we don't do the prevention, we work with our children, the children to start. Um, if we get them at the end in high school, and I teach, I teach elementary, I teach high school as a substitute teacher, completing my master's in education and credential. So I think that gives me more of a, an edge on people that I can go out and communicate um, and, and make changes and talk to the community that most people don't go to, uh, these task force don't go to. You need to go to where parents and community will sit down and listen, and you go out to them as, as a sheriff, not send a captain or lieutenant. I think the sheriff needs to get involved. Currently the sheriff doesn't get involved in any type of those activities. Um, and then just I have a letter from my um, former city manager sh spelling out my leadership ability, people ability, and communications. That's what you need to do. Uh, what we're doing now is not working. Uh, we keep putting more and more money. We need to make that change. That's community, community policing I've written articles on. And I can show that in fact we need to change to a philosophy of that, not a, just a program. And those are the things that need to be done, and that's what you need to bring into this department, as well as other departments. No departments doing community policing. Okay, thank you. So this question is a little on a little different note, um, and and you will be answering it first, <laughs> Mr. Mark. Okay. Yeah. Monica, um, how many sheriff's deputies are pensioned or retired on disability per year? What would you do? to reduce the number of disabled deputies? Well, I'm, a, I'm an honest guy, and uh, I really don't know how many there are. There could be more than what I say or less than I say, so I don't want to give you a number that's incorrect. So I don't know the exact numbers for the deputies, but what I think we need to do in looking at it is we need to develop programs, and it, we have to work with the unions because they want to stop it, is to develop some type of program that will keep the officers or deputies in shape at the level they're at, at the age they're at, instead of letting them not work out in, in those type of things, uh, proper uh, diet and so forth. I think the other thing is, it, currently they have a 12-hour shift over in um, the Sheriff's Department. That's already been shown that it's hazardous to the health of the uh, officers, and that was one of the officers that did kill the two uh, bicyclists was on a 12-hour shift. And the current sheriff knew about that two weeks before and didn't stop it as far as the 12 hours here. Those are ways to get the body into sync and, and not uh, break down in the disability. Because if you work out and you stay in shape at the level for that age, I don't want to say someone like my age has to do it with a 21-year-old, that's not going to happen. 
So we need to develop those programs and give it to the officer, maybe some incentive, but it's also for their own heart and health and their family. And, and that's where you have to work with the unions and then a lot of times the unions will, will not want that to happen for whatever reason. Uh, I looked at that before I, I left San Jose PD of why don't we get that going and it was a union that was stopping it. They said, no, nope, the officers don't want it. They don't want to be in work out. They want to work out if they want to. And so I think that's a disservice to the community and those officers because when they go out there, their, their body it takes a toll with the stress up and down, up and down. Um, even though, like Red says, he enjoyed it. I loved it. I had fun out there dealing with, with the individual. We want to stop. <laughs> Time went down. It broke. Oh, I didn't do that. I made a swing. Okay, I'll. I'll uh, <laughs> whoops. Okay, I think my time starts. Well, thank you. Oh, they're there. getting a lesson. <laughs> I'll give a little plug for the League of Women Voters. Uh, um, if you've enjoyed this program and you think that this is valuable and you're not a member, please become a member. It's really a great organization and um, it's a very modest fee. And uh, you get a great newsletter that. Um, gets you lots of information about what the, um, what's going on in our communities and um, also you, um, you you know you contribute to programs like this um, also in order to get um, just reams of information I urge all of you to log on to smartvoter.org that's a website that um, has been uh, going for what, five, 10 years now? 13. 13, okay, 13 years. And um, it's just chock full of information about um, government at all levels and um, many of the issues that are really important to, to all of us. So um, I urge everybody to try Smart Voter. Um, <laughs> There's always a technical difficulty or two with one of these programs. Yeah. Do you ever watch with the second hand? Yes. Everybody can yell at the same time. That's over. Over. So did you did you get to answer the question? Yeah. So would you like to answer the question about um, how many deputies are are uh, pensioned on disability and what you, would you do to reduce that number? Yes. I too do not know the number of deputies who are pensioned. However, I do have an expert in the back who's actually with the poor end, who talks about the retirement. He's my campaign manager, so we maybe can have a class afterwards. Nonetheless, <laughs> I'll say is this. The way we can reduce the number of, of deputies who are getting injured is through the use of less lethal weapons. That's something that I study and work with at the San Jose PD and help to implement them. Tasers. They're all called, also called slug guns or less lethal, they're where they're rubber bullets. And many times they seem inhumane and people want to complain about them. And the laser, I mean, tasers are going to kill somebody. But the alternative, many times, to the use of a taser is a handgun. And I used to, at community meetings, ask, which one would you prefer then? If you take the taser away from an officer and the subject has a weapon, you can't use the taser. He's going to have to shoot. It's a very simple decision when we suggest the use of tasers for officers because it has saved lives of suspects. It's also saved injuries on officers. With this, we need to continue to use research to find other weapons because there are other types of less lethal weapons that are being discovered on a regular basis. They've used nets that can actually cover somebody when they're on PCP or another type of hallucinogen drug and it helps them, the officers, bring the person down. And with this, I have to add something that Martin, okay, see, my own, my own tool is helping me. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. As sheriff, how will you cover the unincorporated areas of Los Altos? Will we see more sheriff's cars on our streets? That's a difficult question in that 
with the budget being as it is, the county has said they're gonna have to cut $250 million. It's gonna be quite interesting to see how and where the cuts occur. I think it's extremely important, something that I've said in San Jose when I was in Gustine, that you, the people, need to decide where the cuts are being made. Too often the decisions are being made behind closed doors as a result of promises that are being made by people involved in that process. I do not like that. I do not like that type of non-disclosure. You need to be involved. You have to make the decisions as to what areas you're going to cut. Would you want to cut a library's <coughs> time or days or cut a deputy? Because those decisions are going to impact you severely. That was something that I made sure to happen in San Jose when we incorporated the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. We went out into the public, sought input from them, took their input, and implemented it into the plan. In Gustine, when they wanted to raise a sales tax, I also talked about it in the public. They talked about being in favor of it. However, the city manager said, we're going to use the money however we want to. And I said, I will not back it, and I will talk to people about what you've done. It's wrong. You should be involved in this process. Thank you. Well, I suppose it would be either. Well, I think kind of some of the things that we, we would have to do is, um, as a sheriff's department, you would also work with the um, other departments close by to get a relationship. So if for some reason uh, a deputy is not out there, we could get some support from the, the other departments. But I would look at definitely having um, the, uh, the deputies drive around in the area more and maybe even getting into what they call community policing, sitting, stopping and talking to people and finding out what their concerns are. As far as the budget and so forth, everybody's dealing with the budget. We do have a democratic process, and that's why we uh, elect our um, supervisors and city council. And we have to follow that protocol. When we start going around the protocol, uh, we have problems. But I think people should attend the meetings to put the input in. If you don't, then you lose out. But I think um, definitely, uh, from what I'm understanding, there's a need. You don't see the deputies around enough. The other concern would be to me is, if we do have deputies out there, where are they? And so does that mean as a sheriff, uh, I would drive around the area and kind of see where everybody's at. What if they're parked over here? What if they're not doing the job they need to do? Then you get them going. But if no one makes them accountable, you lose those deputies. So I make accountability a top one. So I stop. This next question is a, a, yet a different subject. Um, what do the sheriff's office candidates feel about having sensitivity training to help officers deal with racial profiling? I'm an advocate of this. I am a subject matter expert in the state of California. I help put together the training for the racial profiling. The training that's being used now throughout the state of California has my mug in it. I help to prepare the training. I help to actually assist even with the videotaping of scenarios to give officers in classes topics to discuss. This is a situation. You have two officers even talking about engaging in a stop of some people because of their race and even discussion as well about a white youth in an area where there's possibly drugs, it's not that white youth. All of the discussions, the discussions are extremely important, and I helped to prepare that. I'm very proud of that. I taught cultural diversity, racial profiling, sexual harassment, community relations training at the academy for approximately 28 years to the toughest audience around cops, and I'm proud of that. So yes, I'd be an advocate. I would also then speak through the Santa Clara County Police Chief and Sheriff's Association to all the police chiefs and ensure that the training that's required and advocated at the state level by post be provided and that it be provided in a very effective way because one of the part of that is you need exciting structures to make it interesting for the <coughs> officers. Otherwise, the lessons aren't learned as well. So, yes. Mr. Monica? Um, I'd have to go with Rich as well, and she has, but I, I come from a different perspective. Um, 
The training they give the officers now are, is inadequate. It doesn't do the job. That's why we have the problems. I think when you develop a training, you have to have outside um, groups assisting on the development of it. Because, for example, I, I work with, um, on and off, Silicon Valley Debug, which is a group that uh, sounds APD thinks um, are cop haters. They're not. They're individuals that are trying to get this racial profiling and other type of things under control. I think the other thing is you need to get like the ACLU, you need to get um, NAACP, those type of groups together, and other groups to help on the curriculum. I teach, I develop curriculum for the kids. You, you have to bring outside sources in so then the people become motivated. Um, I go to a lot of police trainings and all, all the cops do is sleep. And so they not getting what they should. So if you bring that type of training that's been developed by the community, with I would look at people that are teachers or have been teaching that would present it, and then you bring that into play. You're going to get a better change compared to what we have now, and, and that needs to be the change on the horizon. If not, we're going to have what we always have, racial profiling, and so we need to stop that. Thank you. Well, in a sense, this question is a follow-up one to that one. Um, and Mr. Monaco, you'll go first on this one. What would your approach be to enforcement of laws regarding illegal immigration? Well, that's an interesting one because um, I'm involved with a group um, on immigration reform. There will be a march on May 1st regarding that. I think um, just like they did health care reform, we need to get immigration reform. It's, it's not my job as a police officer to be immigration. I'm not going to work with the group I used to go and, and get the people out. That's not my job. My job is to patrol around make sure you're safe. But that's where the feds come into place. Um, we need to really get pushed to get the reform going so then we can get it back on track where the people that are here illegally can have a way or method of becoming legal through a legal system. If we don't do that, we're going to have problems, just like in Arizona right now. They just made a, a law that you can stop anybody you want that looks illegal. Well, what's that? Anybody that's brown or black or whatever? So you have to really develop a, a way to attack the problem, and that's through the federal legislation. Well, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not immigration, and I'm not, I'm not in that job. I didn't sign up for that. I'm here to protect you, to work with you, to make the changes. So with immigration, we need to work with our legislators. That's our process. That's from our Constitution. We need to work with that and not go around it and, under it and, and undermine our own country. So that's what I would do. I would work with uh, our communities and I would work with people that are involved in this issue and, and make the change. But until we do that, just like health reform, it'll still be what we got going here. Um, people say we want to take these undocumented workers, throw them away, other people we, have, we want them. I was with this state senators two weeks ago. They said that that group of people bring in $80 billion a year in taxes. Same question. Yes. Yes. Different person. I am going to engage in law enforcement. I will follow the law as it is dictated. With this, the law that we have already throughout the United States is extremely adequate. If I had multiple deputies enough to engage in other type of work, perhaps we might be able to engage in other actions other than public safety. However, at this point, we will engage in enforcement of the law, and when a suspect is arrested for a felony, any type of felony, and especially those that are dangerous felonies, we will use the law of the land. The law of the land is called the criminal alien. Now, I've received a great deal of flack about what I've just said to you because I speak to multiple community groups and I've talked to groups who are Latino. Mark Monica even sent around an email telling people that I'm going to engage in ICE raids and enforcement of immigration laws. He said somebody else told him about it. Nonetheless, let me make it clear that when a person's arrested for a felony, that person then is told and he's held until he's actually prosecuted. The Immigration Border Patrol, when the person's prosecuted, then take the person to the country of origin. I don't care what country it is. I do not want criminals who endanger the lives of people here in the United States who do not belong here. So they will be returned back. If they ever come back, it's five years in prison. No law is going to prohibit it. There's no appeal, and there's no trial. 
That's what I believe, that's what we'll do here. What we have in California already works well. We need some more. <coughs> Okay, another question. If you were able to offer a training course to the deputies, what would it be? And Mr. Calderon, you go first. The training course would be associated to the minimizing of liability, proper documentation and advisement of supervisors during critical situations when there's a potential for a liability. What I mean by that liability is we know it's a lawsuit. The Sheriff's Department in the past five years paid out $8 million. Martin Monica did mention the incident during which a deputy killed two bicyclists, but there's also $3.8 million more during which deputies are involved in incidents that cause lawsuits to be paid out by you. Those lawsuits are paid out by you, the tax dollars that you pay. They're not in the budget of the sheriff. That's why the incumbent says, I'm within budget. If we counted the lawsuits that were paid out by the county, she'd be way over budget. The other part of this, too, is the number of abuses. As I pulled the Public Records Act associated to this, we're talking about excessive force. We're talking about violations of constitutional rights. During one incident, there was a deputy that actually used mace on a very senior woman. I'll tell you, training is extremely important to ensure that officers do not abuse the community, that they treat people with courtesy and respect, and that's going to be a requirement as we talk about cultural diversity. The requirements is to treat people with respect. When you need force, you have to use it. Use it appropriately, but do not go overboard. Thank you. Mr. Monica? Training. What I wanted to say in, on the training, um, I'm going to say in a minute, but uh, going back real quick to the Pink Poodle incident where there was a murder, just so you know, it's, it's, Pink Poodle is run by organized crime, it's run by the Hells Angel, um, and one of the people that work there is a retired deputy, and Lori knows him, and additionally, the Pink Poodle will not permit uh, uniform officers from San Jose PD to go in and do a premise check, which I try to do, and what is, you go in there to do is to see if there's any narcotic activity or uh, criminal activities. The deputies responded and prevented me from going in. So that just gives you a little idea of how they, they train themselves. Uh, what I think is the most crucial area we need training is community policing. What is that? It's actually a philosophy from the top down. It's not just a program saying we've got a little program here to teach you what community policing is. If we develop community policing, the liability Rich talks about will be minimized tremendously. The research shows that. I've written papers on it. I presented in Florida papers on community policing to non-law enforcement, but public administrators. That is a philosophy that no one is using, not even San Jose PD, no one's using it. It's programs, it's different. If you bring that in, you reduce liability, you increase uh, the, the positive support by community where you don't have people complaining, you're working with them, you understand them and make those changes. I can give a lot of examples where I stopped homicides, I've solved homicides, I've prevented rapes by doing community policing. And, and there's a way to teach it. You have not only cops coming and do that, but regular people that are in the business. Stop. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Monaco, you'll answer this one first. Okay. okay. Have you had any experience helping a lost person with Alzheimer's um, be reunited with their loved ones? And what role does the Sheriff's Department play in this kind of an issue? Um, yes, I have many times. Uh, one was, um, I remember over at uh, Stevens Creek at Lawrence, there was a, um, a senior that was walking around and it looked like she was like lost. And then I approached her and then I find out, um, I can't speak her language, it was a, um, a Russian or something like that. But what I remembered earlier that day, I met a family that speaks the, the language, and I took the senior over there, and they talked to her and they told me it appears that she has a little Alzheimer's, but that she, she doesn't know where she lives. So we were able to find out where she lives and got her home. So I think the big thing that law enforcement needs to do is it's a community policing where you actually get out and work with the community. You step out and you talk with people. You find out what's going on. When I saw her walking, there was no crime being committed, right? But I thought, you know, there's something wrong here, so let me just ask her. I, I think you need to, the deputies need to help out on those areas. Law enforcement needs to help out because that would, number one, prevent crimes, 
somebody abusing the individual or the person getting hurt or killed, that it's our job to be out there. And, and that's what we get paid for to, to help people. And if we don't get out there and do it, who else is going to do it? That's what we get paid for. But I love the job, and that's what we need to do. And, and that's what the sheriff needs to say. You know what? This is what we're going to do. If the sheriff doesn't say that, it doesn't get done. And then the sheriff should be out making sure it is happening and not sitting up in our office. I would be out in the field making sure it's yes. I have managed multiple command posts where people have been lost with Alzheimer's. I am proud to say, I, I'm probably thinking at least 20 some, where we've actually located them. We found one that was on the west side here. Do not know how the person actually got over by Allen Rock Park. We think, maybe on the bus. But nonetheless, it is during those times where a command officer involves all law enforcement agencies throughout the city, the media, the transit, contact taxis, hospitals, everyone through the media information officer. With this, the role that the Sheriff's Department has, and also the San Jose PD, and other agencies that they have a search and rescue team. The search and rescue teams that have a bloodhound are the most effective. San Jose PD has one, and I believe the Sheriff's Department has. Now with this, that bloodhound is outstanding. Outstanding. Having more bloodhounds and having them practice and train and train with other agencies so that, in fact, that bloodhound can be used by others throughout the county so that the cost for a bloodhound can be spread out by other agencies is one way in which we can reduce the cost for other agencies and the cost as well for the Sheriff's Department so the bloodhounds or future ones can be purchased by multiple agencies. Thank you. Okay, we just have a couple more questions tonight. And this one is kind of a good follow-up of many of the things that you both have been talking about. Uh, Mr. Kelly, I'm going to answer it first. Um, how does the county sheriff's office interact with city police departments? How will you get city police departments to cooperate with you in gang prevention programs, for example? Perfect. Thank you for asking that question. First and foremost, I will organize the police chiefs by attending the monthly police, Santa Clara County Police Chief and Sheriff's Association. As a co-chair in Merced County for that similar organization, I will attend that meeting on a monthly basis. I will help to chair that meeting because as a sheriff, I can assist with establishing protocols throughout the county for each police chief, therefore then sending the information to the police officers. I'll tell you, the current incumbent quit that organization. I've been told never really attended it and lied about that during a recent meeting at the Santa Clara County Republican Santa Silicon Valley Area Republican Women's Association. And then later that night, admitted to it and said it did not serve her purpose to attend that meeting or participate with it. I will participate in it fully. I will cooperate with the other police chiefs and help with the training. That is how I will, and also then with the training experience I have, as a gang investigator, I will also provide input to the development of a countywide gang task force in areas throughout the city, uh, county, where it's needed. We can then reduce the cost, as I was describing earlier, that actually you're all paying for it for the incarceration of gangsters. If you go to prisons, you'll see a great number of the prisoners there are gangsters, gang or drug involved. And 80% of all crime is committed by gangsters. So we'll do that. I'll do that for you. Mr. Monica? Um, I think it's a two-pronged uh, approach. One is the task force, like Rich says, where we work with all the different chiefs. I think also what I would do is, and I've been working with um, one of the candidates for attorney general, bring the attorney general in and give us some of the, the state monies to really crack down on the, the gang activity here. The other part of the prong would be this, is again, I go back to educating the kids. If we don't go back to where the little ones are at and work with the parents and the families to prevent it from happening, we will, hopefully we'll slow it down instead of saying, let's just keep going after the bad guys, when in fact, 
we want to stop it. The current method that we're using is ineffective, and that's why, as Rich says, 80%. I think everybody here would be in agreement that they would rather prevent than have the big task force and go after the bad guys. I've arrested many gangsters as well um, for different crimes. We still have to do that because they're there. They've gotten to that age. We need to work as a team, chiefs, um, sheriff, uh, even community needs to be uh, in, have input. Because here's the thing, all the arrests that are made are made because of community giving us input. If we get no input from you, we can't make the arrest. So you really are the soldiers in the field for us. So we need community involved. If we don't, then we lose everything. To just say, I'm gonna do it all, that's, that's ridiculous. We need to work as a team, everybody. That means the community people, the educators, the chief of police, I didn't do that, I'm innocent, um, and so forth. So that's what we need to do to actually attack the problem. Stop again, thank you. Well, this is um, kind of a good follow-up, too. This is maybe an opportunity for you to educate us a little bit about um, how we can best use your department. Other than a 911 emergency issue, when is it appropriate to call the sheriff's office for help? Mr. Monica? Well, if it's, if it's an emergency, 911, um, just like if it's a health issue, 911. I think if it's if it's more of that you have some major concerns that you feel it's not a it's not something that needs to be dealt with now, I, I think we need to have more of a, an open communications with the sheriff. When you call, you should be able to get a hold of somebody. I hate when you call one of these departments and no one gets a hold of you. I was trying to get a police officer to go out to a small school and talk to the kids just this week or last week, and no one could call me back. San Jose PD, they wouldn't call me back. It was for preschool, so the kids could see the, the, the officer. That's what we need to start doing. And if we don't do that, it, it's just not, we're not gonna be able to do what we need to do. Thank you. One of the things I'll do for you is I could come back and have several of my friends from Dispatch Communications speak to you and provide you the training on the use of 911 and effectiveness of the <coughs> telephone numbers. This is something that you should already have. And as a sheriff, I would have already provided for you that training. <coughs> 911 should only be used during an emergency. There are times when people have called, I've been up service of communications, and can you please give me the directions to, right, my cat's up in the tree. And with those type of calls, if a person were to call and there was a a jam up of 911, somebody who truly needed an emergency response would possibly be hung up or taken longer to, in fact, speak to. So I'll ask you please do not use 911 unless it is an emergency. If you're in doubt, go ahead and call 911. If you don't know what exactly is happening, call 911. In other situations, you can actually call. 311, and it should be a number that's used by the county. If it isn't, that's something that should be changed. By the way, if you're on a cell phone, don't call 911 because it'll take you to Vallejo CHP. Instead, use, if you're in San Jose or other areas, they should have an appropriate number. In San Jose, it's 277 8911 to call 911. So that effort to make it more easier for you to call 911 on your cell phone should be made available. Well, at, now we're at right at the end. You've had all the questions, and so it's time for you two to give us your closing statements. And we do that in the reverse order of the opening statements. So, Mr. Monica, if you'd like to talk to us, you have two minutes. You got it. Well, the reason why uh, the community should vote for me is because of the new ideas I'm going to bring and actually work with the community as compared to. Um, task force, being up in the office, and so forth. You, you need a sheriff that actually will come out and talk to you, that will listen, and, uh, and not just every so often, but continuously have uh, town hall meetings so that you can bring your concerns. Also, take the time out myself to wear the uniform and go out and patrol with the officers or the deputies and see what's going on, because how can the sheriff make an informed decision if they're not out there? <laughs> 
those are the things that I would be doing. Um, you know, looking at all the areas where there might be gang activity, well, what other type of crimes are concerning to you and your area? That's where I want to come and talk to you. I don't want to say, you got a gang problem? I'm going to be there to do the gang stuff. I'm going to go and talk to you and find out and listen what your problem is. It might not be gangs. It might be graffiti. It might be kids running around. Those type of activities, then we can work as a team to slow it down, either by talking with schools, parents, and so forth. But to always rush to one type of criminal activity is incorrect. We need to look at everything. We look at the whole pie, not part of the pie. And, and that's where, just like when that lady I found walking around, instead of waiting until she's at a, at a critical stage, you go out and you try to find out what's going on. That's what we need to do. And, and if we don't go forward with that, um, we're going to stay the same as we are now, we're giving millions and millions of dollars into the Sheriff's Department and getting one out of it, nothing. There's a lot the Sheriff's Departments can do, a lot. It's not being done, it hasn't been done, and the time's now. The only way to do that is to vote for Martin, Monica, to make that change. Um, I mean, read my letter, read the letter from my um, former city manager, and he details, I'm the only one that has a letter from the city manager about my performance. The current sheriff does it, and, and Rich does it. So I have some type of documentation to show what I'm about and what I have done and what I look at. I encourage you to read it. Thank you. I'm endorsed by the San Jose Mayor. I'm also endorsed by the Sunnyvale Police Public Safety Officers Association Mountain View, the National Latino Peace Officers Association, the County Employee Management Association, so the bosses in the county agree there's a need for a change. I'm also endorsed by the Chief of Police of Los Al the uh, Foothill De Anza College, as well as their Peace Officers Association, and a whole list of others. I've got them there for you. Now with this, I've already said, and it is going to be a priority for me to establish a countywide gang task force to reduce criminal activity and also cut costs that are happening. Basically, you're paying for the, uh, the incarceration. I'm going to be accountable, but that means I'm also going to make changes. There are several that have been mentioned by Mark Monica, and I have to agree, but there are others. As I've begun to evaluate the Sheriff's Department, it's very top heavy. Another sheriff, two assistant sheriffs that were previously commanders, they've been elevated to assistant sheriffs, so they're getting paid more money. There are 15 captains with 16 lieutenants. That is way too many captains, much too many captains. There's going to be an evaluation of that. There's going to be a review of the work that the captains are engaging or not engaging in. And there's going to be a change with this as well. Take home cars where there are some staff who are taking vehicles to other counties to be home. If officers or deputies are not responding to a critical incident in the middle of the night, there is no need for people to be traveling into another county with a take-home car. With this as well, there are many mistakes that have been made, like the De Anza rape case, where the investigators, crime scene unit, did not go out until 12 to 14 hours later. And those are mistakes made because of the lack of experience on the part of the incumbent. She was never an investigative sergeant, and therefore, the mistakes are made. Well, I'd like to thank the candidates for taking part in this forum tonight. Um, this show will be aired on um, uh, KMTV, and I hope that the times will be listed on smartphones before too soon. Um, I want to also take time to thank the volunteers. It takes quite a few people to get an event like this put together. And um, Gabriel Tiemann and Marilyn Turman were the greeters and the card handlers. Crown and Billick and Coeda Chambers have been sorting all of our questions. Um, Joan Papillon and Lois Rosenblum um, were our timers. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, um, Mr. Calvin, for <laughs> contributing <laughs> some. Your, your phone. Um, Annette Diamond made the candidate sign. And last but not least, I'd really like to thank um, Naomi Alpert. She put this whole event together for us. So, um, so again, um, on
behalf of the League of Women Voters for Los Altos, Mountain View, Palo Alto, the American Association of University Women, KMTV, the Los Altos Library, and the Media Center, I thank you for your attention and your good questions. And um, I urge you to check out Smart Voter. And if you're interested, join the League of Women Voters. Thanks. <laughs>